Thank you guys for joining us. Um, we had a uh, nice discussion prior to this. Uh, let me introduce our panelists. Uh, first, uh, my name is Ophir Lupu. I run games at United Talent Agency. Um, Richard Huddy is the chief gaming scientist at AMD. Yep, I have the craziest job title in the world. It's awesome. We'll get more <laughs> into that in a minute. Yep. Michael Pachter, some of you might know from his internet television fame, uh, is the <laughs> research analyst at Wedbush Morgan. Jason Rubin, head of Worldwide Studios at Oculus. So yeah. thanks for being here. Uh, so the title of this is Emerging Trends in Gaming. So let me start with uh, something that I see is an emerging trend, but curious to take your opinion on. So uh, this morning, we saw the announcement of the Razer uh, micro console, a $100 micro console for the living room, um, which is ambitious. Last year at CES, we saw uh, the Valve announcement for the Steam Box. Do we need another console? Can our, can our business, can, 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 can the living room take a fourth entrant into that space, in your humble opinions? Um, if I give a, a not so humble opinion, the answer right. is, uh, is obviously yeah. Right. <clears throat> There's absolutely no problem with a lot of competition there. It's, uh, it's a great thing. Um, as the, the classic consoles, you know, the, the big monolithic beasts, the, uh, the Xbox uh, 7, 720, Xbox One <coughs> uh, and the PS4. Um, there are some people who maybe thought that this generation of consoles will be the last and uh, oh, do we even need this generation? Yeah, absolutely. People love playing games in all sorts of different ways. Mm -hmm. And I think the opportunity to choose a new place on which to play games, whether it be a $100 device from Razer or something bigger and more expensive, absolutely. We love playing games and anywhere where we've got compute, we're happy to play them. You know, I, I'm going to defer to Jason to talk about display technology and different ways to play games, but I, I think consoles are uh, nearing the end of their life cycle. I don't, I don't think we need consoles at all. I think we do today because they, they provide a microprocessor that's fast, that's connected to your television. But I think that within the next five years, you're going to see the content makers embrace playing their, their high quality, fast microprocessor games on any device anywhere. And I think that once phones and tablets catch up with consoles, PCs are already there and, and beyond mm -hmm. it, I think that the simple way to play a game would be to download the game to any device, PC, anybody who has a PC, that's obvious, or a Mac or whatever, or to a phone or to a tablet. Connect that device. Or VR goggles. Well, but, and again, I think you guys are going to change display and change what yeah. we do with the games. But I think that you can access that, that game through any type of Chromecast stick, Fire TV stick, uh, Roku box, Apple TV, and play it on any display, which may be your TV, maybe your VR headset. Um, but no, I don't think we need it. And I think more imp importantly, there is a business model reason to bypass the console, because the publisher will make more money if you play off console. There won't be a console royalty. There won't be the console guys dominating online multiplayer subscription. So I think the opportunity is immense. And again, if you bypass the console, you suddenly expose your game, your content, to anybody who has any type of device with a microprocessor, which means we go from 250 million consoles to 2.5 billion people on the internet. And you know, if you increase your addressable market by tenfold, the, ch the chances of selling twice as many software units is pretty great. So I, I really think about it like television you know, or movies. You used to only be able to watch movies in a theater. You used to only be able to watch television on three or four networks. Now you can watch television you know, via Netflix or Hulu or now Sling TV on any device. More people have access. So I think if more people have access, more money for the publishers, the publishers have to do this because it makes so much sense for them. Um, I still think AMD is built into every one of these devices. So we, we need something to process these big mm -hmm. files. And you can talk about different ways. Yeah, of doing I can it. only answer that as a consumer. And the question would be, what does it bring to the table? Right. If the new console brings a new type of gaming, awesome, right? I, I think touch, a lot of people underestimated, brought an entirely new way to game, entirely new time to game on trains or outside of your normal gaming living room, brought a lot to the table, was huge. Um, I don't know enough about these consoles yet to know if there's anything incremental or if they're just trying to cut the price. And prices drop over time. So I don't, I don't know that that's a long-term reason to bring out a console right now. At a, yes, you save $100, $150. But if, if nothing's changing, 
don't know that it's going to make a big difference. Right. And Michael, you, so back to your point, so you think this is the last console generation? I'm certain, well, first of all, Nintendo will never give up until they're out of business, and they have 8 or $10 <laughs> billion dollars in cash, so they're not going out of business for, God, I would say, they have 20 more years. Um, they will keep beating their heads against the wall and bloodying themselves until the end. They will never figure this out until they get new management. So the current CEO, no way. Um, so yes, there will be at least one, probably two or three more Nintendo consoles. Mm -hmm. Microsoft is different. Um, they just created a Windows 10 division and transferred over a dozen people from the Xbox division. And there's a reason for that, because they're going to try to integrate gaming into all Windows. So they'll come up with something. It'll be a Surface Pro 7 or whatever. They'll come up with something that's a, that, to, to take advantage. There'll be another console from them. Sony, I actually think Sony gets it. It's shocking, because I don't think Sony gets very much. But they do get this. Um, <laughs> They, their whole thing with PlayStation Now and PlayStation TV, those are kind of off-console gaming platforms, mm -hmm. and that's big for them, because they, they didn't invent the console business, but they were an early beneficiary. Everybody's going to try it one more time, and if it flops the mm -hmm. next time, that'll be the last console cycle. Not for Nintendo. They're going to do it five or six more times until they run out of money. Anybody else think any thoughts on that? It's too early to tell. We're going to have to see how PlayStation Now works and everything. If it works as well as I think we think it's going to work right. and brings as much opportunity for gamers as we think it's going to bring, that may lead Sony to a long-term PlayStation brand that's successful but not having to build hardware that they right. ship to Walmart and other stores. Right. Perhaps they're shipping it to a rack somewhere or many wares so that you can play from those racks, whatever it is. As a long-term uh, developer on consoles, I do believe that there's a value to the, the similar system, similar setup, mm -hmm. similar gameplay. Uh, you know your competitors are roughly playing on the system you're playing on. You're not being out foxed because they have a better processor or whatever. Uh, it's easy. It's always the same. You don't have to worry about compatibility of drivers and the other things, there's a value there. And as long as that value sticks around, I don't know, we'll have to see what, what the best way to access that is. Yeah, I can't, I can't um, tell for certain whether Microsoft and Sony might come back and uh, take <clears throat> one or two or three more bites. But I think the, the pessimism in the, in the industry looking at the console generations, there was a general view that mm, this has got to be the last generation. And once again, we're saying, OK, Maybe the next will be the last generation. Maybe. But yeah. you know, with five or six years for each generation, I think what you're really saying is that we'll know in five or six years' time whether this is going to be the last generation of consoles. And it may be, but it also may not be. I think there are plenty of good reasons. There are lots of people have a tremendous amount of fun on consoles. And providing you supply a really great uniform experience where people have a tremendous low latency um, contact with the gaming experience that they got, then I can see it lasting for a while. I can also see people streaming games. Yeah, there's an opportunity to put a huge amount of horsepower in the cloud and to stream a game onto my phone or something like that. But, <clears throat> but it will never have latency that matches what I want in my home. And of course, you guys at Oculus know, know that latency can matter down to the microsecond. Absolutely. It, it can be a really locally. big deal. Yeah. But interestingly, you can, you can combine very low latency in a head-mounted display with higher latency in the actual picture you're showing if you're showing a virtual TV, yep. and that works fine. Where mm -hmm. it breaks down is if your TV is hitching all around. Um, I, I think, you know, in the past, the things that we said were going to kill the console that didn't were all bad for Sony and Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Now the things that may or may not kill the console are actually potentially good for Sony. If PlayStation Now is, is successful, that may be a better business for them in the long run than actually shipping the box. Uh, and they may not lose any of the market strength that they have in, in, the, in the ecosystem through that. Um, and I also think that, that uh, alternate displays, especially VR, have a huge benefit from things like PlayStation Now as a venue for showing that. I grew up in a world where if you wanted to play multiplayer, you dragged your console over to someone's house and played on two TVs, or you plugged two controllers in, and you sat next to them, and the smack talking was half of the fun. Hard to smack talk now. I mean, you don't know. There's a virtual person hiding behind a virtual face. You, you really don't see that anymore. And I think there's, a, there's nothing wrong with today's games, but there's, there's a classic game where you sit next to a person or an avatar of that person, and you play on a screen against them. I'm playing my cart game, and I see my cart. You're playing, and you see your cart, but we can turn to each other, and at least to each other's avatar, smack talk. 
And I think you know, if you take something like PlayStation and add that opportunity with, uh, with VR goggles that can also travel with you, so when you go to your friend's house, you just put them on, he's sitting somewhere else, she's sitting somewhere else, you're all sitting around a room and you can, you can do that, or you're sitting on other sides of the planet, you don't have to be near your box. That's a huge value. Yeah, I think, I think there's a huge market there. I do think it's interesting that Sony is a hardware company, always has been, that has very late in its life cycle gotten into software and is actually taking the lead with streaming games. So hardware less, I mean, they're gonna have PlayStation TV, but they're agnostic to how you actually ultimately end up doing that. Microsoft's a software company that was very late, you know, in its 30, 40 year life cycle to getting into hardware and they're kind of clinging to it, but I think this whole Windows 10 initiative is to go back to their roots and kind of be the operating system for all of it. So I, I actually think wherever it ends up, both guys are morphing into kind of the right hybrid, and I think both, both of them will survive. Nintendo's always been a balanced hardware software company, and they refuse to give up that. I think that's their problem, that they think it has to be proprietary software for proprietary hardware, and that's the model, and it's not anymore. And I think that's the problem. And again, consumer wins if everything is open architecture, everything is uniform, you can play on any device, more consumers will access. So, so I am very confident, as I am with television and, and film and movies, the content guys went for sure in games. The, co the people who create the content you want to play, and that's him with Crash Bandicoot. I mean, back in the day. Back in the day. <laughs> back when you were in your 30s. Um, yeah, the people who, who create the content are going to win. And, well, I, and the consumers Fear and I have had this conversation for a better part of a decade now that as large uh, developers have slowly but surely, due to attrition and or other circumstances, started leaving the business. Irrational is a perfect example of a fantastic game developer that disappeared last year. You can't replace Irrational. So the people that, re, re, you know, you just don't build those teams. You simply don't. There's been two or three teams built over the last five years that didn't involve lawsuits, splitting organizations, and a lot of hell that actually were built from the ground up. Microsoft has done a lot of that internally. Um, those teams that are left have greater and greater value. And the people that are still playing those games are now, instead of 10 million, which was the Crash Bandicoot sales, or 25 million people are playing those games. And that will go up as soon as we take that off of the console that has to sit in your house that you had to pay for, that has to be on a nice TV, and put it in alternate display methodologies, whether that's uh, you know, PlayStation now to a TV with a controller, whether it's onto a VR headset, whether it's on you know, your mobile device, that just expands the number of people that want to play these deep, large uh, products, and there are only a handful of teams in the world, 25 to 50, that can handle making that stuff. And does the, um, does the Minecraft acquisition signal to you in any way that Microsoft is sort of shifting away from Start focusing more, maybe more on the software side a bit? You know, I think Microsoft um, has been fairly branded as a hardcore gaming software company. Mm -hmm. You know, Halo. I mean, the, the few times that they've tried to make family friendly, grabbed by the ghoulies, you know, kind of games, they just bombed. And I think that Minecraft acquisition is a customer acquisition. And I think they're trying to just convert five to nine year old boys into future. You know, Xbox Gears of War players. And, yeah, Gears of War guys. Um, I don't think they really had to worry too much about that because I just think all five-year-old boys are eventually 15 and they're going to play Halo and, and Gears of War anyway. <laughs> but uh, I, I really think it was more customer. But the right. fact that it's kind of a free-to-play game, it's a paid download, <laughs> but it's a immersive, you know, long-lived experience. And Minecraft really is an amazing game. Um, they're trying if you know right. anything about the numbers with that product, with all due respect to Notch, the untapped potential that was there makes this, even if they do it's nothing but keep it in its bottle, mm -hmm. it's a great acquisition. Yeah. They'll make it's, it's just, it's huge. Well, to your point, there's few teams around that, that can sort of and few products with that deliver kind that of, kind of product. And that yeah, kind of with that kind of audience and that kind of untapped potential. I mean, yeah. the number of YouTube videos and, and, and the like that come out of that, it's just yeah. that they don't monetize at all. What was that stat I saw yesterday? It's, more, it's, it's got more views. You, Minecraft videos have more views than Frozen views on YouTube. So it's more <laughs> popular than Frozen, which is it's, shocking to it's me. It's better than Frozen. Yeah. Why, I mean, <laughs> why wouldn't that happen? Depends the music is no. The music in Frozen <coughs> is better than music in Minecraft. I'll yeah. give it that. Yeah. So Minecraft's an interesting title. I think um, the the cost of generating content there is relatively low compared right. to some of the high-end console or PC games that we've seen. 
it's not quite as artist intensive as some of the, the very high end um, titles. And I wonder whether I wonder what that means for um, for the consequences for, for cost of running these teams. We've typically seen the cost go up over the last decade or so. Running a, a AAA gaming team has, has got a bigger and bigger enterprise. Um, and I wonder whether this is a focus on delivering a different kind of value there. I mean, I think your company should get that better than anybody. If you guys remember the first time you looked at a mobile game, it was bowling. and. You could throw the ball down about five stripes down the alley, and that was it, and the ball didn't move at all. That's and okay. now everything is 3D, the immersive 3D racing games that are free, yep. that are amazing, and everything's rendered perfectly. So you're just getting a morphing of the art required. It's going from very simple pixelated art to very complex immersive 3D. Uh, I think that those lines blur. I think you're seeing, you're, you're seeing console games on Minecraft that's pixelated, and mm -hmm. you're seeing mobile games, you know, CSR racing that is amazing. Um, Every time a new game that's less expensive than the cutting edge blockbuster games comes out, someone says, that's the end of the blockbuster games, right. and it simply hasn't happened. Well, hasn't There's a will. massive audience, 25, I think over 30 million people bought Grand Theft Auto, and it is constrained by its distribution medium. It is impossible to play that game unless you have a high-end PC or a relatively decent PC, which a lot of people don't like playing on because they're in the wrong room. Or you've bought a console, which a lot of people don't do because they're not cheap, and it's just not the thing that they spend their money on because cell phone plans aren't cheap. Uh, as soon as that distribution changes, and it can be distributed as widely as Minecraft, which is on your phone and on everything else, I think the gate's open. And these top end titles will just continue to do well. There's nothing bad with Minecraft. There's nothing wrong with doing less expensive stuff. There's always going to be a spectrum. But at the top, everything that's come out that's supposed to change everybody and they're going to spend less money on blockbusters never happens and the audience is always there. Yep, agreed. You brought up a good point earlier because you said, look, you know, teams like Irrational have dissolved, right? And there's sort of been this, this crazy attrition at the top. And so that in my mind, that leads to new interesting development studios with cool new ideas, and obviously VR sort of is at the forefront of this sort of technological sort of renaissance in gaming. So your job is pretty awesome, right? I mean, you see, I can't imagine how many pitches and ideas you see. What do you look for as VR becomes this sort of, this sort of beacon for the next generation of creativity in the business? What, what do you look for out of teams who come to you with ideas. Yeah, there's, there's a huge interest in VR right now, which, is, which has made my job somewhat easy because yeah. everybody wants to hear about it. There's also a lot of big teams, as you said, that have kind of fallen by the wayside and very talented people want to get involved uh, in something new that doesn't require a team of hundreds of people to manage, which my own personal experience after 10 years of running a smaller team but at the cutting edge of AAA games, it just burnt me out. It was a lot. It's mm -hmm. a lot to do. So they're looking for something interesting, something new. The other thing is that when they come to me, I say, look, wouldn't you like to turn back the clock and be there when social was on the horizon but everyone said Facebook as a game platform? Zero installed base. It's never going to work. Then Zynga comes out of it. Or be there at the beginning of mobile when everyone says touch screen? How is that going to ever? People don't want to play games on their phone and end up being Rovio or somebody else. The early movers do really well in these situations mm -hmm. because they fail and they learn how to do the right thing on the second or third attempt. And by the time the big companies that are looking at a number of assets they can deploy to make various games and they say, there's a zero installed base right now in VR, we need to focus on these other They'll miss it. They always do. Uh, some of them are very interested in it. I'm, I'm surprised, actually, how, how the, the big companies are actually embracing VR internally and are excited by it. But it will be the little, smaller teams that are willing to say, you know what, I'm going to fail in my first game. If it breaks even, I'm happy with that. But I'm going to get the knowledge base that, that those are the people I'm looking for, the ones that are the excited about figuring it out. And I think in the long run, those teams, some of them, I, I say this, I really believe it. One of these early teams will generate a billionaire or a group of splitting a billion dollars, just as Rovio did and just as Zynga did. Mm -hmm. I truly believe that this is one of those you know, fundamental changes that's not easy. It's, it's, the, the games are totally different. There is a, a comfort that you have to get over. There, the camera movement we've been doing for decades 
now in the game industry doesn't work well in VR. Um, there are other challenges to VR that you have to overcome. Just as with touch screens, people couldn't figure out on the small processors with a new control mechanism at first how to do it. This may be a bigger challenge even than touch screens, but they will get it. I'm confident of that. I've been through enough new launches of, of it'll never work hardware that, mm -hmm. that I know this one's going to fly. Somebody is going to make, and some many buddies, I think, are going to make a lot of money and also create amazing content that becomes the beginning of of VR, just like Doom was the beginning of 3D games in a lot of ways, or at least 3D you know, first-person shooters, you can be the Carmack of VR, because it requires that level of figuring it out, and you'll be known forever. There already is a Carmack in VR. <laughs> but he's not making games. He's actually making <clears throat> VR work. So somebody else needs to come that's young and hungry, uh, you know, metaphorically speaking, and, and figure it out. And he or she is going to be, you know, a very important luminary in the game industry for many years for doing that. Yep, it is, it is uh, very obvious from outside Oculus that there is a tremendous opportunity to, to take the current technologies, all the stuff that we've learned from building games over the last decades, and to figure out the right stuff to throw away and the right stuff to hold on to. But there, it's most important that you throw out some of the old preconceptions. They don't work, uh, as you say when you try and carry games into a true VR environment. And this is a, this is a gaming discussion, but very briefly, yeah. video and linear content has the same challenge. Some directors come in and they say, whoa, whoa, I curate the camera. That's why I make great movies. You're, take, you're allowing the person to, to manipulate the camera. I can't create a story with that. When two people talk, you put a camera over one shoulder and a camera. That's what we've been doing for 50 years, 80 <laughs> years. H how do I do that? You're the camera. It's weird. You're hopping back and forth. It's like, what do we do? And other uh, young directors and, and directors that are a little more technically savvy are coming in and going, it's more like theater. You know, if somebody walks in from all, you have to yell, hey, in an irrationally loud way, but we'll all accept it just like we accept the weird stuff that goes on in movies that works for the medium. Mm -hmm. And that'll turn your head to see, or light, or whatever it is. And they're experimenting, and they're out there. And it's exciting watching this stuff. I mean, it's really exciting watching the little nuances that are going to eventually be the language of filmmaking in VR start to happen. But to your point, uh, you know, someone's going to create, if not many people are going to create, sort of billion dollar massive franchises in the VR space. And that's going to fuel what's you know, looking at emerging trends in gaming, you know, this last year was an insane year in M&A in the game business. I mean, obviously, <laughs> you guys were a large part of that, as was Twitch, as was Minecraft. I mean, three of those combined, it, that's, a, that's, a, that's a hefty amount of M&A in a year, not to mention all the other smaller transactions. You see that continuing? You see a lot more consolidation in the business on the M&A side? You see developers, is it more on the developer side, do you think? Is it more on the hardware technical side? What do you think is going to sort of drive that Yeah, I, I think it's sort of a feeding frenzy. And, and I actually think that the Facebook acquisition of Oculus make, makes sense to me. I don't know what Facebook ultimately has planned, but I do think they're a visionary company. And I think that you guys are. And I think that I can see how Facebook could see that feeding into what their core, their core mission. Um, the Amazon purchase of Twitch doesn't make sense to me. And, and I don't think it's a bad acquisition or a good one. I just don't know what the hell they're doing. Um, but if you guys pay attention to business news, Yahoo is rumored to be buying somebody every other day. And I think it's because you know, there's speculation Marissa Meyer's out if she doesn't do something with all that Alibaba money. And Google was in the final stages of bidding for Twitch. Um, you've got these massive companies. Microsoft bought Minecraft, rumored to have been bidding against Activision. Mm -hmm. These massive companies with huge balance sheets, tons and tons of money, and they don't want to miss something. Mm -hmm. And so what's cool, I think, is Oculus is just a unique, interesting technology. They're ahead of the curve. You guys are the billionaires now that are ahead of everybody I'm else. I'm not. But, so, <laughs> somebody, but somebody, somebody said, I can't build that and I don't want to compete with it, I'm going to buy it. Mm -hmm. Twitch was a really cool idea that was an accident, but it worked. It, you can't build that, you got to buy it. Minecraft, really cool, bunch of guys in a garage who came up with a fun little pixelated game, next thing you know had 200 million players. You have to buy that, you can't build it. So as long as there are these businesses that are different and giant, somebody's going to want them. And I think, I, and I agree with you, that we're not even at the beginning of the innovation you're going to see. Oh, not even I mean, close, it's yeah. going to be so much. So no, I, I don't think this slows down ever until the Googles, Amazons, Yahoo's, Microsoft's, Facebook's run out of money. 
and they're probably not going to run any money. Well, I, I, can, I can actually tell you why Facebook uh, acquired Oculus, because Mark has been pretty clear about this. He believes that every decade or so, uh, and, and those are his numbers, a new platform comes along. And he believes that this is a new platform, that this will uh, revolutionize the way people interact with a lot of things. And though we sit here and talk about games and film and the obvious, that we have no idea what the Uber is of VR. Right? When, they, when they put the iPhone out, no one said, this is going to revolutionize uh, taxi driving or, or, or car sharing. Nobody had any clue that that was going to happen. And we believe in real estate, in architecture, in uh, medicine, in many areas that we're not focusing on internally right now, but we believe if the ecosystem is there, it will be built, that people will use VR for its inherent advantages over other past platforms, and it will become a future platform. User uh, that, that, is, that is exactly why they did it. However, as you said, very early stages. Yeah. And it's easy to dismiss it because it's so early, but important to note that Oculus, at least, has not released hardware that it calls final because it realizes how early it is. It is not racing the market. It is trying to get this right so that the consumer, when they put on an actual consumer headset, gets the experience that they expect, and that leads to the Ubers, and leads to fantastic gameplay, and leads to all the other things. And the, the race with chipsets and everything else, and screens and, uh, to support this, is also ongoing. Rending everything in stereo at a higher resolution and then yep. distorting it. I mean, this is the greatest thing that ever happened As to chip companies. Company, boy, oh boy, you we love us, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> we're still at the early stages for all of this. So you're not going to tell us when we can expect a consumer version? Today. I am not today okay, going to sorry. tell you when you can. I can <laughs> tell you that uh, Oculus is, and this is, this is fundamental if you're in the company. You realize how important it is. Oculus is not racing to release hardware to monetize. Oculus is racing to create hardware that is as good as it possibly can be. And not to plug Oculus, but if you go uh, to our booth and see Crescent Bay, you'll see what we now see as a, as a platform upon which we can build a consumer-ready VR experience, uh, for, for PC at least, and what that achieves. It's, it's a very different experience than you expect. It is a th it's a thing of great beauty, um, and as you say, as a, as a graphics company, we are quite delighted with the, uh, the pressure that you guys put on us. Um, quick back of the envelope numbers suggest that you're going to soak up something like the next factor of 100 in horsepower that we can generate in our GPUs. So we have a, a lovely future in front of us. Every now and then people say, well, you know, the graphics business, you're pretty, pretty much done, yeah? I don't think so. I, think no. we have I a, love at least talking to our scientists so. and having them say things like, well, if we had a 9,000 by 9,000 or 12,000 by 12,000 pixel yeah. screen in each eye, you wouldn't see any pixels. Whoa, that's 24,000 <laughs> by 12,000 screen if it's one or two 12 by. We don't have that. I mean, we just don't have it. And to drive the, the, you know, the realistic simulations on that in stereo, distort, it is just unbelievable amounts of processor that we want eventually. Yep, and we will be delighted to, uh, to provide exactly that processor. Yep. Richard, you've got the best title I've ever come across in the gaming business. So you were the- Thank you. Yeah, so you are the chief gaming scientist. So just, we've only spoken a couple times prior to this panel. What, what does that entail? I'm fascinated, because you talk about emerging trends. You probably see stuff coming way down the pike. Uh, I do, and it's, uh, it's a real treat, I have to say. Um, to have this position with AMD. It comes in two halves, um, and they're both communication roles. One is um, doing things like this, trying to explain AMD's reasoning, um, to lay out why the, the future is, uh, is a bright, shiny thing that, uh, that you should look forward to, <clears throat> um, and why we make some of the decisions that we make. Um, so I have the, the privilege of seeing what we're doing over the next handful of years, um, how ambitious we are to, to satisfy the needs of uh, games players everywhere. Um, and I also work with games developers and have to understand the kind of tech that they're producing, particularly those um, very high-end games developers who are looking at um, a, a, a kind of reality that is really persuasive, genuinely um, persuasive in games. And the, the factor of 100 that I mentioned um, that uh, Oculus will, will bring as a demand for us. Um, <clears throat> for the last 15 or 20 years, I've been telling people that uh, photorealism, a really genuinely photorealistic gaming experience, is about 10 years away. 
And I've been saying that for about 15 years, right. so it, well, it ought, to be, ought to be true by now. <laughs> These days, I'm down to about five years. Mm. I reckon in five years' time, we can trick people. And that's a real privilege, to be able to see the kind of stuff that's coming. Mm. I've, I've had the pleasure of working with some of the, the really high-quality games developers, the monolithic um, quality stuff, folks like uh, DICE who build Battlefield. Mm -hmm and understanding the algorithms that they're trying to implement, looking at the quality thresholds that they're setting for themselves and where they want to go over the next five or 10 years or so. Um, that's the coolest part of my job, sitting in the office of the CTO and arguing for the kind of capabilities in mm. hardware that will satisfy the needs of those games developers. It's, uh, it's quite a treat, actually, yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Must be. Um, so let's play futurist for a minute. So we're sitting here next year What's the biggest story of 2015 in the gaming business? The Oculus launch. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Maybe not. Um, <clears throat> so my New Year's resolution. Here, here's my best pun of the day. Go Big build-up for this one. My New Year's resolution is 4K. Okay. Uh -huh. 4K gaming. 4K resolution. It's that kind of a joke. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's not that right. good. <clears throat> so we have put up with relatively poor quality displays for the last decade or two that I've been in 3D gaming. We started at 640, 480 displays with 60 hertz CRTs, painful, painful experience, and you'd get a headache after working with these monitors, so people went to 75 hertz, 85 hertz, etc. Um, I think one of the really exciting things that we're seeing um, that will get us part of the way to the, um, the whatever it is, 50 million pixels um, that you need to, uh, to give a, a really great VR experience. Um, one, of that, one of those steps is 4K. Um, it's becoming a big deal in uh, PC gaming at the moment. We're trying to get all of the artifacts out of the way. Um, we have seen the launch uh, here at CES of uh, quite a number of FreeSync monitors, which are about getting rid of artifacts. And it's clear that there is a renewed vigor um, for getting rid of the artifacts in gaming, creating a more immersive, more realistic experience mm -hmm. that gets rid of um, all of the things which make it less persuasive, as well as improving the business model that lets you potentially stream any game to any device. Now, that's a great place to be. Um, but I think, I think Razer has an interesting uh, approach. I think if they produce a, a cheap console where everything is, uh, is local and things work beautifully, um, it's, it's a combination of slick and smooth and everything's local. If that's a perfect experience, if it's mm -hmm. beautifully wrapped up, that's great, let's do it. Um, on the other hand, if you feel you can solve the problem in a, in a wider environment where you really can reach out to 10 or 100 times or 1,000 times more gamers, then that's great too. But get rid of the artifacts of the gaming mm -hmm. system. Get rid of all of those problems there. And I think this is one of the wonderful things that, that Oculus are doing. They're absolutely stamping on the artifacts which spoil a gaming experience in one way or another. And primarily, we see it in terms of the, the visuals of the gaming experience. So it's all about high quality pixels at really high speed and so on. But I, one of the things I really, really love watching with people who play with an Oculus system for the first time is the way they look down at their legs. Where are my legs in this environment? <clears throat> time and time again, we want to see ourselves really embedded in that world. And I think this is they part of the, the persuasive The first thing nature. everybody does is put their hands up. Yeah, we want to know where we are in that world. That's how we reckon ourselves, by, by me moving my hands around here. I'm, I'm figuring out where I am in the world with that kind of stuff. And every time we get rid of those artifacts, we create a, an opportunity for a new audience to be excited about what we're doing. You know, I, I think Jason hit on something, though, about the mindset of you know, creators of televis televised content, that you have to film it a certain way, and it takes these cutting edge new creators of content to think about different ways of display. And I think the problem with 4K is that the gaming guys are going to lead, not the TV and movie guys. Uh, the TV guys aren't going to have a 4K broadcast standard. It's chicken and egg until everybody has a 4K TV. You're not going to buy a 4K TV unless you have a reason to buy one and if there's nothing broadcast in it. So I actually think this is the story. I think that gaming might lead, the reason, you know, lead people to adopt 4K technology. Mm. Fortunately for us, the price between 4K and 1080p is compressed now to where it's a few hundred dollars yep. more for the same size TV. And you know, if you guys remember back when your, your family got your first 1080p TV, it was a few thousand dollars difference. Yep. So um, my first one, I think, I remember, I couldn't believe when you were telling me that your three 1080p TVs back in 2004. But um, I paid 3,000 for my first one. I could not believe I spent 3,000 bucks on a TV. I just bought a 65 inch for $900. And, and I know you can get them cheaper. Um, 4K is going to be under 1,000 bucks for big screen next year. And I think it'll be under 500 bucks by the time we have Oculus. 
um, which, uh, which is good for you because you're gonna have at least 4K display wrapped around the head. Uh, I think that's really the story. It's consumer adoption of display. Once we have it, that's when the content's gonna catch up. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you have television and movie content like that, then everybody's gonna have the technology. It makes it just easier for everybody. We need not only the pixels, we need a quality of pixels. And a lot of the phones that are currently out there, they just don't bother with that quality of pixels with a refresh and everything else that's going on because it doesn't make any difference if it's a... Right. So there's, there's beyond just getting higher resolution, they really have to revamp their screens for VR. Right. Because uh, there's no incremental benefit at this distance to, to what they need to do for us, you know, for, for Uber or whatever else they're do, you're doing. But there's a huge difference at, at it's right your eyes. you know, with the refresh and everything else. 60 frames a second is not good enough for us. We, we have a device that's out right now, Gear VR, that's 60 frames yeah. a second. We want better refresh because there is a very different experience you get at 90 frames a second than 60 frames a second. Yeah. There's a magical point at which your brain kind of buys in that's somewhere above 90, we think. Uh, right around 90, some 80 for some people, 100 for other people. But 90's good, 60's not good enough. So we'd love to see phones refreshing faster and drawing faster is, again, no benefit on a phone, huge benefit for us. So we really are ex you know, asking for all that stuff. Just quick, how many people here have actually tried Oculus? Because I think we've talked, not to shill it, but that's a pretty good number for That's an average room, actually. A lot of, the number of people that are aware of VR is smaller than you'd think outside yeah. of this, these circles. Right, we the number of people of that have ever tried Oculus is far, far smaller than the number of people you would think. Man, if you haven't, you really should go check this thing out. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Thing of beauty. it's unbelievable. And, and this Crescent Bay is one of our latest demos. It has new audio stuff in it because we've been sitting on our tails for years with audio. We haven't had a good reason to do spatial audio that works well. Now that we actually know where your head is, all the old spatial audio that was done that just assumes you're looking straight ahead changes because we actually have the data of where your ears are. So we're now starting, and this is just our first implementation of that, but the, the audio guys are reinvigorated. Everybody's reinvigorated because all of a sudden all this new technology uh, has, a, has an output. It has a reason to exist. Um, so it's worth seeing. Uh, the audio that's being shown today hasn't hasn't been shown before. Cool. So, the, so also looking forward into 2015, biggest challenge facing our business, you think, is? Persuading the, the doubters that every one of these new <laughs> consoles deserves a place in the market. Um, I, I, to, to me, it's, yeah, I mean, I think that's a big issue, actually. I think the, the doubts that you have about some of the folks, um, whether it be uh, Nintendo or, uh, or Razer, whatever, um, their opportunity to experiment in a market is, is really key, um, and they will come up with some, some new tech, or they will deservedly fail. Um, there is, actually, it's not about tech. It's a, it's a new experience that they need to, uh, to produce. And if they produce something novel um, and uh, create a new opportunity for themselves, then they deserve success. And if they don't, if they, if they innovate in the most dull, obvious way, then OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're like dinosaurs. I think the thing I'm most concerned about, and you and I talked about this last night, it, the barriers to entry used to be low, and they're really high now, mm -hmm. including for free-to-play. So you and I were watching whatever we were watching on TV last night in the bar, and some ad came on for a game I've never heard of. Same here. Number yeah. 41 game on iTunes, and, and there was a television ad on ESPN for a free-to-play number 41 game. That blows me away. And I, you have all seen Kate Upton in her white flowing gown, you know, advertising Game of War. I mean, who heard of Game of War a year ago? The answer is none of you because it launched in March. Um, but, but the idea that, you know, that, that some startup is spending tens of millions of dollars a week advertising mm -hmm. on TV, that makes the barriers crazy. There are fewer players. Jason used to work for THQ, a quality company that got you know, put out of business because the barriers got so high. Um, you're down to just Activision churning out the same stuff every year, EA churning out the same stuff every year, and I think it's Ken Levine at Irrational no longer making Bioshock, you know, moving on to something else, David Jaffe moving on to something else. I think that's bad, and I think the biggest challenge for the industry is to encourage innovation. That's why I'm excited about Oculus, that you're going to get these best and brightest guys to try something completely different, and you're right, somebody's going to succeed. But the challenge is, the conventional development as we know it is getting old and stale and boring, and we're getting this sequels after sequels after sequels. I'm actually the most encouraged this past year at Blizzard 
doing Hearthstone. Mm -hmm. Like, what a cool departure for those guys to do something free to play that works and is fun. Um, but in, you're not seeing it from Zynga. You know, you're not seeing it from King. Uh, I, I think that's a problem, that these guys are also so big that it's hard for someone to, to come up and, and compete without hundreds of millions of dollars. I just, I don't think I've been as optimistic about the game business in mm -hmm. a long time. I think there's unbelievable opportunity coming in a lot of places. The, the reason I joined THQ is, you know, on, on its way into bankruptcy was to save the teams and or end up yeah. bringing the company around. We managed to save the teams, which meant that at least five AAA or A teams survived. And, and you were that close to turning the company around. We were pretty close, yeah. Um, but those teams did survive. Um, I believe that if they survive the length of time it takes for streaming to a wider uh, number of platforms, then their business will become easier because the budgets won't rise as fast as their audience will for a little while. So they'll get a little pump of value. I think at the low end of the business, you know, when I was making video games in, in the late 80s, you, you, you couldn't, we, I mean, literally the first game I did, which was lower than 64480 resolution, by the way, that was halfway or a third of the way through my career of making games. Um, we put it in Ziplocs and took it to the local store. That was the distribution you could get easily. Now you can be sitting in Uzbekistan and have an internet connection and publish in the United States and a hundred something other countries at the touch of a button. So even if you're not making a lot of money on mobile games because of the big guys and the barriers of entry, you're learning. And you do have that lottery chance of doing it, of making money. And as time progresses and you get better at what you're doing, you have these opportunities to embrace new technologies like VR or any of the other things that are out there. And so I think from the low end, just somebody coming out of college or out of high school that wants to get into video gaming up to the biggest companies that have been hamstrung to a certain extent by the distribution methodology for the last couple decades, uh, that pinch point is going to disappear. There's never been a better time to be making games as a developer. Um, and I would say as a publisher, it's a great time to be in the business as well. That was, that was part of the model with THQ. If you can survive, it's going to be bright skies. We didn't, we fell a little short of, of raising the money we needed. Um, but in any event, the, the, it is all played out as we thought it would. Um, so I am I, actually optimistic. I think it's a great time to be a game maker, and I think it's a great time for the game industry and the consumer. They have games in more places. No, no doubt. They can play in more ways mm -hmm. for more business models, whether it's free or they want to pay up front, whatever. It's all out there for them, and, it, and that has not existed in the past, and it seems to be just spreading. And we constantly make the mistake of thinking that each of these new models of distribution will kill one of the old ones, but in fact, people continue to play them. Totally. And we just find a, a wider and wider ubiquity of gaming. People got very mad when they talked about digital distribution for the last round of consoles. Personally, I didn't understand it, but there were people that were absolutely adamant that anything out of the box was a destruction of their lifestyle. So it's, it's hard to, you know, things don't change as quickly as you think they would. Interesting. Well, uh, I think we have time for questions. We should open up the last few minutes for questions. So I think, are there mics around here? Or if you just want to stand up and yeah, they can shout it out, I'll repeat it. Oculus guy. In the Amherst, we have Oculus as basically an enabling technology to kind of unlock the next innovation possible, you know? Kind of like how Google was. But I was wondering, what are your, what do you have cooking for augmented reality? And maybe, I know you would just require so much gesture based computing kind of company. So, like, you move towards augmented reality and maybe natural user interfaces. Right. So the question is, is Oculus working on augmented reality as opposed to like virtual reality? Like see-through augmented right reality. Now? Yeah, uh, augmented reality is very interesting. We're a virtual reality company right now, and we're very focused on virtual reality, but we like augmented reality. Uh, it remains to be seen how far in that direction we go. <coughs> A company uh, based in Washington, um, I think it was Media Vision, MVIS, um, they were working on virtual retinal display. Uh, and I was just kind of wondering, um, it seems like, you know, Oculus kind of chose, well, we got panels, panels can be miniaturized, they work, we got lenses, we can figure all this stuff out. It's a good technology base. But, you know, some of the stuff that the VRD stuff was really exciting, it was, was you could bounce a laser off of a surface into the eye and, and paint at whatever tracking speed you wanted. So pixels kind of mattered less. 
And I'm just kind of wondering what your thoughts for the future of the display technology for Oculus and, and even for the industry is when it comes to, I mean, it's great if you're sitting in a room by yourself and you want to put this big headset on, but it's kind of awkward if you're walking around the street trying to, you know. So just curious about that kind of future, what we're looking at. You, you want me? Well, uh, the question is about alternate display technologies. There's light field projection. There's a lot of stuff that's, that, that, that's out there. We're very aware of all of them. Um, we are working really hard, really hard, to get comfort and presence with the screens we have today. Um, some of those technologies are inevitable and probably will be a very big part of VR's future. But right now, um, the screens that we're using uh, seem to be the best pathway uh, forward for us today. Uh, there are companies out there that are working on those technologies beyond a shadow of a doubt. Um, will we adopt them? remains to be seen. But right now, screens are working really, really well for us. And each one of the technologies you brought up, by the way, and the one that I added, they each have their uh, limitations. It's, it's field of view is a limitation on some of the other technologies. Um, for augmented reality, field of view doesn't matter as much. For virtual reality, we already wish we had a wider, wider field of view. So mm -hmm. painting lasers in, you, know, you can see, if you put your fingers on the side of your head, you can see 180 degrees. It's blurry out here, but you can see your hands move at 180 degrees. We don't want to restrict to where the laser is coming from. We would rather have that wider field of view. We're right here right now. Um, so there's positives and negatives to all the technologies. We're more than aware of them. Yep. We have a, a nice, well-known set of artifacts that we get with these technologies, as well as um, potential uh, ways to address many of those artifacts, not necessarily all. I know there are some, some quite subtle problems in there which are still to be solved. But where <clears throat> one of the nice things about the approach that we're taking at the moment, like supporting VR, uh, is that we do know what the steps are that we need to, uh, to, to make um, in the same way that 3D graphics is all built on polygonal modeling. You don't think about the polygons when you look at the stuff that's going on in the game. But underneath it, we know that the, um, the kind of model that we use from a programming perspective works well and is extensible to cover the future. That's right. We yeah. see the way to the finish line, and the finish line for us is launching a VR yeah. product that is comfortable and provides presence. Yeah. So we see that pathway with screens right now. Thank you. Uh, great panel. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Kieran Foley from Immersive Entertainment and Ion Business. A couple of questions for you. Um, for each of you, I'll ask you to put on your prognosticating uh, hats and tell me what, in your opinions, do you see as being the next killer application for VR? Recognizing it's too early, uh, just from what you've seen in the industry, um, where do you see that first killer app emerging? And the second part of the question is, uh, each of your companies that you represent, if, uh, if a fledgling software company is looking to partner, uh, what type of resources do you make available to those uh, beginning you developing last, groups? Thank you. Uh, I, I want to I want to get something out there because I I really I said this earlier and I really believe it. it. Facebook buying Oculus made sense to me, not because of games, but because of everything else. So I know Jason's a game guy and I know they're gonna they're gonna lead with games, but it seems to me the Facebook model is I can be on vacation with my friends. I can actually see what my friends see. You know, I, I thought about an ad and actually getting into the Porsche when I get the Porsche ad on my Facebook feed and looking around and being in the car and driving the car. I, I can see that. So I see humongous consumer application for VR. And, and I wasn't kidding. I just got a uh, vacuum cleaner, a, a cat and dog vacuum cleaner from Neil. And it has the most complicated user manual. I know how to turn it on and push it, but I don't even know what all the attachments are. And it's in German, and it's impossible to read. And I thought, God, VR. I would love to have them actually. I have actually, that vacuum cleaner. Yeah, it's, it's a an, great it, vacuum cleaner. It's a great cleaner. vacuum cleaner, but I don't know what the attachments are. <laughs> it makes no but, sense. But yeah. just to have, the, to have you go through, and again, you know, to go through, you could have somebody guiding a surgeon, you know, a, a, or a surgeon guiding another surgeon because he's been there before. There's so much you can do. So I think the the non-gaming commercial applications are, are limitless, mm -hmm. which is a reason why we're actually going to own these headsets. I, I, you know, that's, I think, the biggest impediment to, to selling them for games is unless they're free. I mean, if they're 500 bucks or 1,000 bucks, you're gonna limit the audience. But you will pay 500 bucks if you can do everything on it. And, and I, I think the greater the number of applications, the more likely we are to, to buy the headset. And games can be the lead application. I mean, games aren't the reason you bought your phone. But it's the number one re, you know, use of the phone is to play games. So I think that VR is going to be that way, too. It might not be the reason you buy it, but you're going to use it all the time for games. 
Yep. Personally, I'm, uh, I'm pretty excited about the, the impact on education. Um, I have a, a couple of teenage sons, and I can imagine them uh, going through their education any time from about five um, upwards when you, you want to do the magic of storytelling to them and tell them about ancient Egypt or something like that. <clears throat> so hard to do persuasively with a, a book. Um, much more easy to, uh, to convey with models where they can actually explore and zoom around and see stuff. I think there's a great opportunity there. Educational software has failed so many times. It'd be nice if someone could actually uh, make that a, a successful market. I, I think it's a great opportunity to, to bring software into new markets, new opportunities. Um, and I've got, uh, I've got plenty of places where I can see opportunities. Um, I don't know which one's going to be the one, but there are so many opportunities, it's wildly exciting. I agree, totally limitless. I mean, all, all you need to do is, if you haven't seen it, I'm sure everybody here has, is that YouTube video of the 80-some-odd-year-old grandmother putting on the, the, the headset for the first time and experiencing it, I think, tells you everything you need to know about the potential applications for that thing outside of games. Pretty yeah. interesting. Yeah, I, I, I think I've been around enough not to try to predict where these things go. Like I said, I don't believe that anyone at Apple could have predicted Uber or any one of the dozens of other multi-billion dollar yep. incredibly useful companies that came out. I see a lot going on and it's all interesting to me. Um, I also live in a life where I'm very aware now of Oculus, I'm very aware of VR. And just my life has been a little crazy lately, just personal story. I'm moving to Menlo Park because that's where Oculus is moving. So I had to find an apartment. So. I go on and look at these apartments, and I say, wow, that looks great, or a house, and I, that, that's a big pool. And then you go out, and it's a koi pond. And if you were sitting in VR, and you could actually look around, and there are Matterport, there are all these companies out there building these things. That revolutionizes Zillow. That revolutionizes Zumper, or the other uh, apartment site. Then I'm simultaneously building a house in Los Angeles while, while I move, and I'm talking to my architect, and you look at plans in 2D, and I'm actually really good at 2D because I've built games for years. I mean, that's level design. And I built my house in 3D and gave it to my architect and said, let's do this. And he laughed and said, ha ha, physics, that won't work. And we got it done. In any event, I built it in 3D. Just, just so physics. I'm, I'm way ahead of the curve because I can <laughs> rotate my house around and go in and see on my screen where I am. And, I don't have a way to get that into VR. That's ridiculous at this point. I should be able to sit in every room and say, you know what, this is wrong. The TV is blocked from the bathroom and I could move that wall six inches and it would be so much better. We can't do that yet. So mm -hmm. then I get on a plane because I've been commuting back and forth from LA to, uh, to the Bay Area. And here actually, it, it has been helping me. I put on my Gear VR and I watch a movie the whole way. It's terrible during takeoff because the screen, the theater moves. But as soon as you get flat, I'm sitting in coach in, in Southwest, and I feel like I'm in a giant theater watching a movie, right? And then I land an hour later, and I take it off my head, and I save the rest of it for coming home, and it works totally fine. And then I go in, and I have a conference, and it's this weird tilted monitor that's kind of got, and I have to go into a conference room and book it out, and, and there's people in five places, and only the screen's jumping around with who's where, and why can't I just sit at a conference table, with a, even if it's avatars or whatever it is, and just, the, the Everywhere. And that's why it's a platform, not a game system or a film situation. It's, it, I think it eventually will be a platform that all of these things move into. And unfortunately, we have to get a, as you say, a critical base of content to get to the point where the other things exist. We're not a phone like iPhone. So you don't have a reason to have it anyway, which iPhone had for touch computing to, to kind of, and touch games to come out of. But we, I do believe if there's a big enough entertainment uh, value there. Um, and don't underestimate, I think, the, the film potential in mm -hmm. VR as well. Uh, and the studios are very forward thinking um, in VR and doing a lot in VR right now. Uh, it hasn't shown up yet, but they're all very, very excited about 3D, uh, 360 experiences, um, and even about sitting in a theater. And the one thing that hasn't happened in VR yet, that I, just, just, I'm sorry I'm monopolizing, um, the one thing that hasn't happened in VR yet that I believe is going to be the biggest positive of VR is the social aspects of it. We still, and this is, this is something Oculus needs to fix, we still haven't sat in that theater that I sit on with a plane next to somebody and be able to talk about the movie with somebody on the other side of the country. And that, if you look at Facebook and what Facebook does, it all kind of sort of makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I think social and, and, and VR is huge. And we just haven't even seen a good demo of that. Cool. Just a question on uh, barriers to entry. I think there was some talk earlier about how 
the barriers to entry are increasing, especially for mobile. I mean, what are those barriers other than capital? You still have, I think, a couple hundred thousand mobile games produced every year. So, like, what in particular are those barriers? And then, as it relates to uh, Oculus, you know, it might be too early to tell, but how? What would a development budget look like for a game on Oculus? And you know, is that is, is it going to be a game that really gets widespread ado adoption for Oculus that that lends itself to all the other use cases uh, that you talked about? And I, I did mean capital because uh, you know when Jason said the early adopters of, of VR, uh, the early developers, are somebody's going to be a billionaire. He's right because there won't be 10,000 developers chasing that. There'll be a dozen, and somebody's going to emerge. Um, in mobile, because there are so many hundreds of thousands of people trying to make mobile games, the biggest barrier is just being noticed is the customer acquisition cost. And so these ads with Kate Upton just mean they're paying you know five bucks, ten bucks per user that they acquire. And way, just, way more in other countries, yeah, too. Right. Yeah. That's a barrier. So I, I meant capital only. No, the, you're, getting, you're getting the highest quality developers moving into free-to-play now. And mm -hmm. I mean the highest quality. So that was with the comment about Irrational, that, that they aren't making you know, Bioshock anymore. They're making approachable games that, that, that will have a 10x the audience. Um, so that's great because the real barrier here is just talent, and I think our schools are turning out better, better qualified artists, better qualified developers. The hardware is is keeping up with what they need. Um, so the environment—that's why you're excited about it. the environment's great. It's just that to get noticed takes a lot of money. Yeah, for me, the the barriers to entry um, always go down when you have a new disruptive tech that appears. So when VR becomes a new opportunity for people, then effectively the barriers are, are dropped. Um, and it's curious that when we look over the, the last decade or so and we pick out folks like Rovio who took good advantage of uh, smartphones <coughs> um, and uh, uh, Zynga um, on Facebook, um, you look at uh, uh, a few other folks in, in this kind of way. Yeah, they, would be they, they, they stand there as, as having created new opportunities mm -hmm. for themselves and from those opportunities having made substantial uh, sums of money. Um, and I suspect mine, Minecraft belongs in the, in the same area. You know, the very inventive piece of um, game design, which meant that it wasn't all about other costs, the capital costs that they might have to meet. <clears throat> this is the great thing about a disruptive tech like VR. And, and that's one of the reasons why we welcome it a great deal. It, it creates a tremendous infusion of excitement in the industry. There is clearly wild excitement about Oculus and the other folks who are in VR as well. You're not alone. And if you were alone, it would probably be a bad thing. Yeah, it's great that there is competition uh, from folks who are also looking at other VR solutions. So I think those barriers uh, come down very, very dramatically. Um, and there are great opportunities for the people who solve the problems quickly. And, and I love this idea of rapid iteration. Yeah, make a few mistakes, that's okay, <clears throat> and then get stuff right and start making yeah. significant money out of it. The, the barrier to entry on mobile, uh, I haven't done the math in a long time, but I used to follow it. You can take what Apple says they pay developers, which they release every now and then, then take the number of titles that were developed and figure out how much each title on average makes. And it's not a lot. That's, that's yep. like, and then, it's like, it's like 4,000. Yeah, four to 6,000 yeah, last yeah. time I did it. But yeah. it, could, it could have changed. Then you take out the top 10 titles, which are making tens of millions of dollars a, a month, and it becomes $2,000, $3,000. And then you ask yourself, what can you make if you're paying yourself a reasonable salary for $3,000? And the answer is, it's a net loss business. So it's a lottery. You go in, you try to make something. You can create Flappy Birds. There's no question that exists. But on average, people are losing money. And the way people are getting around that is they're going in and they're spending a decent amount on the game, but they're really spending their money on advertising. Uh, and they're spending their money on buying installs. And there's a lot of ways to buy installs, some of which are totally above the board, some of which are not above the board. Um, and that business, once you really get into it, you realize is, is a very expensive business to be in. And there are arguments around right now that it's a VC bubble where VCs are giving the money to a few companies that are then spending the VC money, and some of them fail, but some of them, because they have that money, rise to the space where they then rise above all the, all the teams that don't have that VC money. So you need to effectively raise capital not to make the game, but raise capital to get the game to the point where it has a chance of succeeding, and there's a lot going on there, and you, you can kind of unravel that for yourself. Uh, with, with regards to Oculus, that is not happening right now because there's not a large 
number of people that are building games for Oculus, which is the opportunity. Uh, you asked what budgets we're seeing. All kinds of ranges. All kinds of ranges. And I think we have two, first of all, we have two devices. There's Gear VR, which is very compelling because you can take a knowledge base that comes from mobile gaming and turn it into games relatively quickly. And then we have the PC-based Rift, um, which in general is going to be a more expensive proposition to make a game for. But right now, people are starved for content that are on the, the consoles. And I think when the consoles launch, they'll be starved for content for a while. So less money experimenting works. And that gives you an opportunity to go out there in a fair marketplace where nobody's spending huge amounts of money advertising, because it doesn't make sense, to survive on ideas. That's the opportunity. And if your idea is Angry Birds, you'll, be very, you'll do very well. If it's not, you didn't have a good idea. And there's, there's no fairer system than that. So that's why I like these new platforms. I think we have I time for one last question. question, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, this was just a quick one, generally towards you, Mr. Rubin, but anybody can answer. Um, what do you feel, this is kind of something, this has gone back and forth from everybody I've asked about this, about the other side of um, VR, of like, the Oculus is all vision, but motion and stuff like that you mentioned with your hands, because that really kind of breaks the experience for a lot of people. Um, there's a lot of like treadmills and, and even kind of Intel uh, real sense, I think they're calling it, of all this different stuff. And I want to know your opinions on that. VR is broadly defined taking over reality from people. Oculus is simply right now focused on the eyes and now the ears because we think that those are kind of fundamental. You are absolutely 100% right that we are not suspending people from the roof in haptic suits. We would love to get there eventually. Touch, motion, your inner ear. I mean, our fundamental problem in VR right now is that if you move somebody's eyes convincingly, their brains say, I'm moving. But their inner ear doesn't feel that if they're sitting in a chair. So we would love to get at your inner ear. Nobody's really messing with that that I know of to any significant extent. That, that will happen. It's, it's funny now, but you know, I have a 17-month-old daughter. By the time she's your age or 18, it'll be totally normal to have something. Um, She'll have a socket in the back of her head the like, uh, Matrix, like Neo out of Matrix. Matrix. Exactly. You know, it's, it's, yeah. <clears throat> it's, it's interesting. Let me, a, little, a little story. Uh, DreamWorks went to Times Square and showed 5,000 people how to train your dragon flight simulator. And this was very early, and it was DK2. So I actually, I think it may have been, no, it was DK2. It was definitely DK2. So it's not even the technology we would call consumer ready. And they put people on saddles and leaned them forward. And when they did that, they found that the number of people that kind of didn't like flying a dragon, and flying a dragon's kind of the use case. We say, hey, let's stay away from that for right now. That's a little, it's a little aggressive. The number of people that were uncomfortable went down. Then somebody at DreamWorks said, wait, what if we put a fan in front of them? and just blast air on them. And it turns out that when your eyes see movement and your inner ear is like, I'm not moving, but your skin's feeling wind, now it's two against one. This is theoretical. <laughs> yeah. And cool. a marginally larger number of people said, awesome, doesn't bother me anymore. Then they started vibrating the seat. I don't know why, but for some reason, the number of people that were discomforted went down yet again. So there are all these little things that aren't even that difficult that add to the VR experience and start making things work. Uh, when one of the seats broke, the vibrating seat, the number of people that were uncomfortable, and these were all sub 10% numbers I'm talking about here, but the number of people that decided that they weren't as comfortable uh, went up a few percentage points. So it was actually uh, relevant. And again, this is all hypothetical because we're at the beginning of this. We don't, the science is, is to be discovered. A lot of people are thinking, hmm, your inner ear is vibrating. It says, this is kind of weird, trust the eyes. We don't know. We really don't know. But we're learning as we go. And all of the devices you're talking about that enable you to walk, that enable you to touch and, and, and kind of trick other parts of your body are very relevant for VR in the future. And they're all going to come around. And right now, Oculus is, is not working on most of those. We have acquired a, a hand tracking company, but uh, we are not working on treadmills. Well, Jason, Michael, Richard, thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you guys. Thank you guys.